safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and you're listening to Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. On today's episode, I have a good friend of mine and former Disneyland cast member, Chris Hartwell. His story's amazing, and he talks about not only being a face character, but what happens when you meet a Disney legend, or, you know, what do you do when you fall on your face in the middle of Fantasmic? Well, he certainly knows, and he's going to tell us, coming right up on Dream Finders. Chris Hartwell, welcome to Dreamfinders. Oh, thank you so much. It's it's uh, great to be here. We appreciate you being here. And by we, I mean me. I'm literally the only one who does this podcast. <laughs> um, but anyway, I brought you on today uh, because we've known each other for a little while now. Indeed. And when we first uh, met, you were working uh, for Disneyland. I was indeed, yes. I was working at the theme park there in Anaheim. One of the first things I was curious about for you, though, before we get into all of your different positions, um, do you remember your first trip to any of the Disney parks? Yeah, so I was I was a late bloomer, uh, as it were. Uh, I, I lived in Washington State growing up, so not close to, to Anaheim necessarily, and certainly not close to, to Florida. Uh, my very first experience at a Disney park was actually Euro Disney, um, which is actually in Paris, France. Uh, and that actually occurred when I was nine years of age, uh, and we were, we were traveling around Europe for a month, my family and I. And it had been, you know, one cathedral, one old, you know, mausoleum, one statue after the other. And which, you know, for my my brother and I wasn't the most exciting thing ever. And (laughs) and one day my parents pulled a fast one on us and actually took us to Disneyland uh, in 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 Paris there, which was brilliant. It it was definitely something that I'd heard, you know, the quote unquote legend of. Uh, and it definitely lived up to it. It was just, it was just fun. It was, it was a breath of fresh air in the midst of all these, you know, old things that I obviously much more appreciate now. Uh, but it was, it was great just going on the rides. It was great uh, passing by the characters, uh, which at that time I distinctly remember thinking, "This is so silly. Like, there's a person inside that suit. I can't take a picture with that person." Uh, which is so funny. Uh, obviously, fast forwarding a number of years from that point. But yeah, no, it it was great. Uh, And I've actually been back uh, since uh, to Euro Disney, and it was just really fun to kind of go back and and retread those steps and and remember specifically my very first experience in in any sort of Disney park. Yeah, I think that's a thing that um, a lot of people have uh, had that opportunity to sort of, if they went twice at the very least, in many ways, the parks are like the Truman Show or more like Groundhog's Day. You know, like I I remember going in the other day and... um, you know, whatever show was happening at the, at the, by the castle Mm. was going on. And I already knew that's when it was going to happen. Right. And there's this like kind of sixth sense that you get, uh, Mm -hmm. about the, just how the patterns of the park work, the Mm -hmm. flow of everything. And that's just coming from a guest perspective. Right. Um, but for you as someone who has seen behind the scenes, um, and has lived with that pattern, you know, worked with that pattern. I'm sure there's a lot of the intricacies that we see on the outside is a lot more chaotic on the inside, I would assume. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things that uh, when it comes to the the intricacies and the goings on and the people behind the scenes, it really is, and this may be no huge revelation, uh, but it's it just depends on the person in charge. Uh, so different days, a, a different person might be in charge of a specific show, uh, might be the manager on a specific event. Uh, might be the lead, as we call them, on a specific attraction. And if that person is someone who believes in Walt Disney's dream of of allowing his story, or a story, to continue forwards in these parks, then that time can be magical backstage, and it can feel effortless, and it can feel like there's no chaos at all. Uh, But then there are those that they're there, this is their job, and uh, they, they approach it as such. Um, and, and sometimes the, the chaos can certainly uh, creep up just because they're all worried about how many guests are, are viewing this event, how many guests are progressing through our line, how quickly are they progressing through our line, numbers, 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 dollars, dollars, dollars. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's it maybe not a surprising statement at all, but it really 
did depend upon uh, how much the person behind the scenes believed in in Walt's vision uh, and 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 saw the value in in that place and in storytelling and in in magic in a lot of ways. So, yeah, it, it kind of it was it was certainly one of those things that I very quickly I, th- I felt like I transitioned from this is pure magic, nothing can ever. Uh, ever touched this place as far as uh, reality goes. This is completely removed from that. We have live in this beautiful Disney bubble to kind of swing to this pendulum, the other end of that pendulum of, oh, this is just a job and, and how jaded am I to, no, it really does depend upon uh, upon who's who's here and who's, who's believing in the vision and who's believing in the ideas behind this place. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a really good point. And so I guess my question for you is, what made you decide to work for Disneyland in the first place? Definitely. Uh, it was definitely a process for me. I, I had graduated from, from college uh, down in Southern California, uh, where I had journeyed to, uh, to go to college from Washington State. And at the end of college, I had a very specific dream, which was to actually move to New Zealand. Uh, and, and work in the film industry down there. I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson and all that kind of ilk. And I was just excited to, to, to move on to that next, uh, next step. Um, but it wasn't an immediate step. I needed something to, to pay the bills until I got there. And so I just started applying at random places. And, and one of those places was Disneyland. And there certainly was, even if it was just far back in my brain, this feeling of, I won't be there long enough to spoil it. I'm just going to pop by, mm. I'm going to grab a few paychecks, and then I'll be on my way. Well, you know, continue to fast forward a few months from there. I got a job in attractions originally. I worked at Autopia, uh, which is one of the uh, only guest-controlled rides at Disneyland, and that the, uh, the guests actually get to uh, drive a car around, and even though they're stuck on a track, they can control the speed of those vehicles, um, uh, which is much to our dismay more often than not. <laughs> <laughs> um, even as we remind them before departing every single time, do not bump the car in front of you. Uh, so yeah, it was very much just a job initially. I was just going to hold down this job for a little bit of time and then I'd be off on my way to, to explore the big wide world. So your hiring process, you know, I, I always find it to be, um, and, and, and we'll get into more of the different jobs you, you sort of took throughout the park uh, in different ways. Um, so you just kind of came in as a hired gun. Like in the sense mm-hmm. that whatever they wanted you to do, you would do. It wasn't like a specific position. For sure. Yeah, it was actually, it's funny. I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, it would be very curious to know how my Disney career would have progressed had I stuck with what they originally assigned me to, which was to the Jungle Cruise. Oh. Um, and they said, hey, you can start one month earlier if you go to Autopia. And at the time, I was, again, I was in need of money, not a a position that would have been super exciting to me for a long term. And so I said, Autopia all the way. Get me in. Give me that paycheck. Uh, Yes, please. And looking back on it, I just just shake my head and go, why (laughs) did you? Oh, the Jungle Cruise would have been amazing. Um, yeah. If you guys haven't ridden Jungle Cruise, essentially that 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 ride is made or, or broken, uh, depending upon the employee who is the skipper, the person yeah. in charge of the boat. One hundred percent. And I, I I'm a person, I'm an actor. I enjoy telling jokes. I enjoy entertaining people. So had I been on that boat, uh, telling those jokes, reading out those very silly lines. I, gosh, it would have been it would, would have been wonderful. Uh, but, but but as it was, I, I said, hey, let's let's jump on Autopia, and I'd like to you know breathe in fumes for the next nine months and, and knock a year off my life. So let's let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, that's a fascinating decision to make for someone who is into acting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And not to mention that Autopia is an original 1955 opening yes. day attraction, and is known for its uh, how do I put it gently? Um, <laughs> its ungentle nature. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that harrowing and dangerous uh, occupation of being someone who has to somehow cattle uh, ranch all those cars day in, day out. Yeah. So again, like I mentioned, this is the only guest-controlled ride in the park. And and, and I, I'm not joking when I say that is not a coincidence. I think they very quickly realized putting the controls in the hands of thousands upon thousands of guests daily is not the best idea. Uh, and then it's one of those funny things too, where you you do find yourself in in a situation down in a literal valley, uh, stuck in the smog, uh, breathing in actual fumes because authenticity. You know, we're all about that at Disneyland. <laughs> uh, we actually want gas powered vehicles down there. 
Um, and, and it's, it's a very brief, silly story, but I actually found myself getting run over one particular day by a guest. Um, and my ankle was never fully recovered, um, which I blame more upon myself than the actual attraction. I, I should have taken better care of it. I should have taken a week off, but I was like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, but it certainly, it certainly was, I think an, an apt word for it. it was just the one that you threw out there, Nathan, which is, is harrowing. Yeah. Um, it, it certainly when it came to the, the quote unquote romance of the place and the uh, the magicalness of the place, it very quickly dissipated in that that place. Um, and so to kind of progress forwards from that, when when plans to to move to New Zealand and, and work in the film industry there sort of fell through um, for a number of reasons, part of which was I was um, getting other interesting gigs here outside of Disneyland. I decided, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to stick around and I think I'm going to stay with Disney. But I don't think I can stay in right. this department and right. continue forwards. So that was kind of when the next uh, the next step began. Yeah. Is Now let me ask you something about Autopia. Um, do you think it's past its prime for a land that is Tomorrowland? I absolutely. I, I completely think that there when, – when, yeah, when it comes to a land that's supposed to be about – tomorrow, uh, the next step forwards, it is tragic to me that we are clinging to gas powered, um, vehicles that, that feels very of yesterday. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it just doesn't for me make a lot of sense. I think, I think part of the reason, uh, to get kind of very can candid with it is the fact that they uh, have a deal with uh, certain, uh, certain gas companies, uh, for quite a while it was Chevron. Um, I believe that it is. Oh gosh, I don't actually. I, I'm not going to even say right now what it is, but I, I'm not sure. They they have actually moved on to a new a new uh, gasoline company, a new Honda? car company. Oh, that Honda. sounds that, that does sound right to me. Yes, I believe yeah. it is now Honda, um, and that just that that does pay the bills. That does keep that place open. I think in a lot of ways, uh, and and for me, I felt like Brad Bird and uh, Damon Lindelof's film Tomorrowland was an unfortunate misstep in both of their careers. But I had so desperately hoped that that film would be a mega success and kind of reinvent what it was to enter Tomorrowland. Because I felt like, and I feel like uh, for a long time, that land has kind of been lost. It it, it doesn't exactly know what its identity should be. So at Disneyland Anaheim specifically, you know, they've incorporated some of Marvel's properties and they've incorporated some of Star Wars, uh, which in, in both instances doesn't scream to me. Tomorrowland. There isn't this feeling of excitement over the future and and what will tomorrow bring. Uh, so so yeah, I feel like for me to answer your question simply, Autopia is just a holdover from from what it would have looked like uh, to, to to be a guest of the of the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties entering Disneyland and going oh this is exciting you know my own personal vehicle that I can drive around and my kids can drive around how exciting right. yeah. which of course now is is not all that exciting at all right. Yeah, and I think you know, um, I think your ankle also probably has that feeling. <laughs> Only slightly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long were you in Autopia? About nine months. Nine months. Okay. Yeah. So after that, uh, and deciding that New Zealand was not um, the sort of journey you thought it was going to be, uh, my guess is you you auditioned for face character work. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was one of the situations where I had backstage. One of the great things about being a cast member is we get sneak peeks at the upcoming auditions. Um, more often than not, it's simply a we're letting you know before we post it on DisneyAuditions.com that this audition is coming up. Sometimes it's a completely in-house audition in that you either have to be a Disney employee or sometimes even in the specific department, i.e. entertainment, to audition for that role. Um, but that's one of the really great benefits of being a cast member already. So if you're interested in any way in getting into entertainment specifically, it's not always a bad thing to start out somewhere else because sometimes you can kind of get the inside scoop mm. and, and that edge. So I got the edge. I was told that uh, coming up here in a few weeks, we have this audition happening and um, and, oh gosh, I, I almost forgot this. I just now remember this. Uh, and I took down the address and I was very excited to go. I had um, not a I, – I had no idea what they were auditioning for. Um, so so I took down the address. Uh, I excitedly waited a few weeks between when I took down the address and when I went to the, the audition. And I drove out to the audition place that Saturday only to realize that I had 
in my phone put down the wrong city. And I was in the wrong city for this audition. So I, I raced up um, from Long Beach to Los Angeles to, to the appropriate place, uh, thinking that I was lost and then I surely had missed the audition uh, to just barely make it in the door. Uh, they were, they were you know, assigning each person numbers and, and they said, oh, all right, fine. We have, we have one more space. Uh, let's just jump on in. And I, and I auditioned and it's, it's, it's very unique. I've been on both sides of the auditioning table. And there is an element of auditioning for Disney that I really do appreciate and respect, which is if you don't look the part, if you don't sound the part, they're not going to waste your time. They're going to line you up. They literally do this. They line you up in a row. Um, Imagine a row of 10 individuals, which are sometimes 20 deep each row. And they have you walk up to the front of that row and they say, hi, can you please smile for us and say your name? So you walk up, you smile, you say, hi, I'm Chris Hartwell. And they go, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." and there's two people there looking at you and they look at each other and they drop some notes down on their little clipboard there. And then they move on. Thank you so much. And they walk down all, all 10 individuals. And by the, after they get all the way down to the 10th person, they, they step back. And again, they, they kind of look at each person and kind of whisper to one another. And then they go, thank you so much. Uh, we'd like for one, five, and 10 to remain. And all the rest of you, thanks so much. Have a great day. And so if you're not the right look and the right sound, then you have the entire day to carry on your merry way, which is kind of wonderful as an actor. Because mm-hmm. oftentimes you spend the entire day waiting, believing, you you read this part, you read it passionately, you really throw yourself into it, uh, and they say, no, thank you. And if you had known earlier on, you would have been spared a lot of time, and they would have been spared a lot of time. So all that to say, I was fortunately um, uh, asked to stay and, and to come back and read, and they specifically had me read for the character of Bert from Mary Poppins. And very fortunately for me, uh, probably about five years earlier at that point, I had played a part in the uh, stage play of Oliver, which is set in England. So I had had some experience with the Cockney accent, which is obviously what Bert has. And so I you know, very quickly looked over the script. I came back in. I read. They asked for a brief adjustment. I think they were just saying, you know, Bert is a very energetic person. Try to just give us a bit more of that energy. And I did so. Um, and then, uh, that was it. And I, I returned to my normal job working at Autopia. And this is certainly not the case with everyone. Uh, but for me, it actually was two months until I heard back uh, huh. about that. Uh, I think it was one of those things where they were kind of at that specific audition kind of cataloging. They were recognizing that one or two of their birds might be, might be dropping out. And they just wanted to say, all right, we want some insurance when they do. Uh, and it was, Two months later, and they and they called back, and I had almost forgotten at that point that I had auditioned. But they said, "Hey, this is so and so from casting. Hope you're doing well. Uh, remember, two months ago you auditioned for us." And I was like, "Oh, y- yes, I, I do. Uh, we'd just be curious if you'd be interested in coming on and uh, and playing the character of Bert in the park." And I uh, very quickly said yes, and uh, yeah, things moved forward from there. Right. And you, I mean, and we'll get into some of these. You've done multiple characters after mm-hmm. getting hired. So Bert was your first. Is that, yes. I mean, sort of. Uh, and then my guess is um, the other ones that you um, end up taking on, it's sort of a rotating panel. Some days you're Bert, some days you're others. Or how does that sort of work doing multi? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll speak specifically to my experience and then uh, speak more generally to, to the kind of normal face character experience. Sure. So for me specifically, um, Bert was my, my bread and butter. Uh, that was the, the thing I returned to day in and day out. I also was a, what's called a character host, which essentially our job is to look after the, um, what's called fuzzy characters or sculpted characters, uh, as they've been uh, more recently called, which is any character that has a mask, Mickey Mouse, Goofy, Pluto, Chippendale, you name it. Our job was to essentially be the voice for those characters. So when it was time for a character to leave, we would be the one to be the bad person and tell the guests that it was time for Goofy to leave. Uh, And specifically when he'd be back and where. So in addition to doing that, I also played the character of Bert. Um, Initially, quite rarely, as the years went on, very frequently. Um, And then also I was, uh, during the seasons of Halloween all the way through the new year, also the character of Jack Skellington. Um, 
So that was exciting for me uh, because whereas Bert was – he he did kind of play second to fiddle to Mary Poppins. Uh, one of my favorite things to do was to essentially, whenever a guest came and approached us, prove that I was actually more interesting than Mary Poppins, <laughs> which was definitely not something that I needed to do as Jack Skellington. I was the rock star. Uh, people – People absolutely adored that character, and you had to do so little to blow their minds, uh, which was delightful. And it was a completely different physicality, uh, a completely different voice, and with the character specifically, I mean, you can look him up online, a very different makeup job, obviously. Uh, The way it kind of worked with that character look-wise was basically our upper lip down to our chin was exposed, and the rest of our face was uh, a large mask, uh, which still, in my opinion, looks like an alien versus Jack Skellington, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we were able to, to talk to the guests while still looking like Mr. Skellington or looking a bit like him. So during that season, I was you know jumping back and forth between the two. Um, I also did a number of parades. I did celebrate a street party, which, as I always described it, is a horrible parade to watch, but a great parade to perform in. <laughs> Um, it's not it's not super entertaining. It doesn't really kind of possess a lot of that great, just intricate production design and sound work that a great Disney parade does. But there's a lot of dancing and a lot of shenanigans when it comes to the characters. So therefore, it made it very fun to perform in. Uh, so I was kind of yeah, hop socking back and forth between those two throughout the year, uh, and then and then when it came to to actually doing uh, the, the the characters during the Christmas and, and Halloween season, it was kind of leapfrocking back and forth between Jack Skellington and Bert. I also did the uh, the show of Fantasmic, which was great, um, and played some of the Prince characters in that. Okay, so let's get uh, let's go from character to character, because I do have uh, sort of specific questions per um, role in many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Let's go ahead and we'll start with Jack. The thing about Jack that I think is interesting is he's one of uh, the scarier costumed sort of looking mm. characters in the park, uh, at least mm-hmm. maybe to kids. And I, and I sure. sort of feel like, did you find that you had to uh, bring a delicacy to sort of the more macabre uh, for some children? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I honestly, Nathan, when I approached the character, that was my biggest fear. Mm. I, I'm a skeleton. I'm, I'm a walking, talking skeleton. And as the, as the king... Of, of Halloween Town, the the thing that I take pride in most is my ability to to scare the bejeebas out of people. That, that's right. just what I love. That's the thing that I enjoy. So I was just constantly thinking, again, approaching the character. I hadn't played a single day in it at this point. This is going to be real delicate balance. I've got to be. I've got to be. You know, I've got to be scary, but I also have to be approachable. Here's the thing: if you're going to get in line though for a character, you kind of know what you're signing up for, mm. which is something that I didn't really take into account. So most often. Uh, parents and children alike who get in line for Jack know what they're signing up for. So when they come up, it actually takes a lot to face any of them. Uh, even the kids, even the little kids. Very often I will find kids being more scared of Bert than Jack Skellington because those kids have signed up to meet Mary Poppins and this random guy in colorful stripes is suddenly standing there and, well, who is this guy? Whereas if they've gotten in line for Jack Skellington, they've signed up for Jack Skellington. And yeah. they're ready for his silliness, his scariness. And and actually, that was a delightful revelation because it was so much fun to you know try and be scary and to try and surprise people because there was much delight in that. It was almost people kind of – it felt like they were walking into a horror film knowing that they wanted to be scared. And it was fun trying to scare them. Uh, absolutely, though, there were kids that their parents were the ones that were the big fans and the kids were like, what is happening right now? And you absolutely had to be very gentle with them, which is also, I mean, Nathan, let's get real, is so fun. It's so <laughs> fun to be sweet. It's so fun to to win that little child over who is so terrified of Jack Skellington, but by the end of the interaction is just, this is my favorite person in the world. Please, let's be friends forever. There's, there's nothing quite as rewarding as that. Um, so... So yeah, to, to answer your question simply, it just depended on the guest, but more often than not, the guests were much more game for the scares and the thrills and the chills than I thought they might be. Well, then let's talk about your scariest character, which uh, I guess now is Bert. Um, <laughs> uh, who would have thought? Um, but um, weirdly enough, if you type uh, into Google a Bert <laughs> costume or anything of that nature, you're sort of Pinterest's Bert, like... Uh, <laughs> 
weirdly, you come up quite a bit. Um, <laughs> even on other people's eBay costumes, there'll be a picture of you in it and them saying, I can get you something like this. What do you think it is about Bert that so many people do love? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I, I played the character for for almost nine years, just shy of nine years. And there's a reason for that. Uh, let's, let's be real. Let's be honest. Let's be completely frank. This is a job. Um, I punch the time card. I have specific sets. I have specific responsibilities. And it's a very um, demanding position in the sense that it requires a lot of energy and a lot of focus. I am interacting with guests, responding to whatever question they might ask me. I'm doing so in a different accent than what I own myself, so I've got to be thinking about that and really being present in it. But the thing is, he's such a just beautiful person. He's, he's so full of life. He's so full of joy. He's so interested in everything. He's a jack of all trades, so he can be interested in whatever you might bring to him. And that's just a great person to be. Um, it brings hope and joy out of me. It's, it brings hope and joy to the guests. And that's just so energizing and rewarding. So, yeah, I, I, I love the character. The fact that he was the first, uh, the first person I got cast as and the character that I remained consistently throughout my stay at Disney was such a blessing and, and really did allow me to stay there as long as I did and enjoy playing that character as long as I did. He, he certainly has his ardent fans and they're wonderful to interact with. Um, but he also has people that have the care less about him. They're, they're interested in interacting with Mary Poppins. And this is more of a Chris Hartwell thing than anything, but I just like winning people over and, and being able to, no, no. So it's, it's great that you're talking to Mary Poppins, but how are you today? Let's talk together. Just you and I, and, and then seeing them slowly, but surely, be won over by his his personality and his outlook on life uh, is just is just a great joy. And then too, I mean, and this certainly happens with with this, the Jack and Sally characters as well. But there is something wonderful about being able to to do sets um, as we call them to interact with that Mary Poppins character. Uh, and certainly, some of those actresses are more interesting and enjoyable to interact with than others. Absolutely, like any coworker. Right. Uh, but there is something very fun about being able to share that time with someone and be able to walk off set as we call it at Disney and go, wow, wasn't that great? Wasn't that horrible? Wasn't that so interesting or whatever it might be? Yeah. And that's, that's interesting because it's true. I feel like those who um, are in face character and they do face character work, um, the, the ones that always seem to be dream jobs are the ones that are in pairs in some sort of way. Hmm. I think of Alice and Matt Hatter. People really love doing those. Um, um, and then of course, Mary and Bert. And it's, it's, you're, that's a good point. There's like sort of, even if, um, it's a different sort of pairing each time, um, you, you probably do get a rhythm and it allows that sort of straight man, funny person quality to come out more. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, opposed to someone just sort of being by themselves. Yes, and I can't agree more. And I think, and actually, I love that you bring up the this straight man, funny person. My favorite Mary Poppinses were the ones that were sometimes to their own chagrin, so committed to being the straight man, or in their case, a straight woman, which allowed me to be the full on funny person because it's tempting. It's so tempting to want to become the funny person when when that person next to you is getting all the laughs. Uh, but the best Mary Poppinses were the ones that were so fully that Mary Poppins. And the only time that they approached being quote unquote funny was when there was just that little cheeky wink to the guests, mm. but there wasn't any sort of, Oh, I have to make the funny joke. I have to, I have to in some way meet this person where they're at. There's just the perfect, you know, complimenting uh, of, 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 tones and personalities right because i mean mary's whole thing is sort of doing a job or being there for people with at the same time not coddling in the slightest um whether that be children or bert or anyone so that i can imagine that's a very difficult role to pull especially if you got sort of a ham in a bert role as well yeah which i certainly am and yeah the, the and actually i i was mean to to reference this for for mo most uh, face characters, especially the the females, they will daily rotate between positions uh, from from Belle to Cinderella um, to to Mary Poppins, and and those that honestly uh, more often started out in a princess position find it more difficult to kind of be 
in that Mary Poppins role because just mm-hmm. like you mentioned, there's so many things to keep in mind and a very difficult balance to strike. Whereas those that started out in that Poppins position, those that really owned that um, from kind of an actor's point of view, uh, oftentimes did some very brilliant work in those positions. And I do, I do miss them dearly. Now, something about Bert that I think is really interesting is it's one of the few characters in the park uh, where there is a living, breathing human being who um, mm. the world knows as that character, <laughs> um, who also tends to show up at, at the Disneyland um, resort for his birthday or things of that nature. Did you mm-hmm. get to experience uh, any Dick Van Dyke um, <sighs> in your position? Yes. So I'll tell you right now, um, both of these stories are sad. Uh, so brace yourself. Um, so the, the first time that I met Dick Van Dyke face to face was at the end of a long Jack Skellington day. So to, to, to put it in your mind, um, imagine someone who from their upper lip to their, to, to their chin, um, is painted all white with some kind of interesting black marks on their, on their mouth, look like teeth. Um, And then in their arms, they're carrying this kind of weird-looking, dilapidated rubber head. And so I'm standing backstage um, waiting for my shuttle to pick me up. So many locations are spread across the park, and you need shuttled sometimes from one location to the next. And I'm waiting to get shuttled back to the makeup room to remove my makeup. And I'm just standing there texting on my phone, and I look up, and it's, it's Dick Van Dyke. He's walking right by me. He's literally six inches away from me, just passing by. And it didn't matter where I was or where I was going. It was time to start walking. So we fell in stride with one another. And uh, he glanced down at the Jack Skellington kind of dilapidated head in my arms and kind of let a little chuckle. And I said, oh, <laughs> don't worry. He didn't feel anything, uh, you know, which is my way of cracking some stupid joke uh, to which he responded with another chuckle. And uh I so desperately wanted to say I I have portrayed your character in this park for the last five years uh, at that point anyways, but it just felt so fanboy. It mm. felt so so uh, just non real to me. So I just said, uh, Mr. Van Dyke, I just want to let you know that uh, I'm a huge admirer of your work and thank you so much for all that you've done. Uh, thank you. And he said thank you so much, and he jumped into his car and off he drove. And it was just like. Ah, I, oh, that was great. But oh, I, I wish I was in my Burt outfit and oh, you know, that mm. kind of thing. So it was a great moment. Uh, at that point, he was, it was the Christmas season and he was there uh, doing the candlelight service that we have each year and uh, and reading the, the excerpts from, from the Bible at that point. So, so that was one of the instances. And the other is far more tragic, uh, <laughs> which is I, uh, on a specific day, um, was genuinely feeling ill. It wasn't me just calling out sick to, to take a day off. I was genuinely feeling ill. And um, so I had to call out. I had to say, hey, I can't, I can't make it today. And so someone else got pulled to my position. And at the end of the day, I checked Instagram, and one of my closest friends, who was also one of the Mary Poppinses at that time, had posted an image of her, a Bert and Dick Van Dyke, taking a picture together and it would have been my day. It would have been me. And it was just, uh, it was heartbreaking knowing that, uh, he was right there that I could have interacted with him. Um, but, but nonetheless, I was very, I was very pleased for Colson that he was able to get that, that moment. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was certainly something that was like, ah, oh, this, this is a character that that's so near and dear to my heart that I, that I really do take seriously. And it was, ah, oh, so close, so close. I think this brings up a good point, though, right? There, the thing about face characters, they have this ability um, to meet people, or I, I guess the the thing is, is you can be um, even inside of Mickey Mouse, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But you could be opening a new thing with any celebrity in the world, right? But all they see is Mickey Mouse. Um, mm-hmm. Being a face character allows you that opportunity to sort of stand out um, and actually express something or you know say something. One thing that I hear happens um, now and then, or maybe this is a, an older sort of thing about the parks, is that there's sort of a hierarchy when it comes to characters uh, and their work. Generally, the face characters in Disney parks are attractive in many ways, right? Did you ever experience that, or is that something that you think is sort of a bygone sort of concept? Yeah, no, that's a great Great question. It, it certainly has been and, and can be, again, something that's an issue. Uh, I actually, in my second year of portraying Bert, actually became one of the face character or 
character lookalikes, as we might call them, uh, trainers. Um, and having experienced just a little bit of that, one of the main things that I constantly told my trainees coming into these face character positions was, you are not better than anyone else in this park. Not better than your character host, not better than your photographer, not better than the fuzzy standing next to you. Yes, you have a certain skill set, a certain look that allows you to portray this character, but that does not make you better. And I don't ever want you thinking that. And it certainly was something that, again, look, we're all humans. We all, you know, uh, feel uh, superior or inferior, oftentimes because of the specific way that you look. Um, but I think it's so important, especially in a position like that, to be reminded that, like, yes, you have this look that we need, but that doesn't make you better than anyone else. So I felt like, and, and I don't, I'm not tuning my own horn here, but I did feel like there was a slow decrease in, in that kind of mindset in, in my time being there just because I was so intent on saying, look, the, these hosts, these, these guests, these other employees will honestly look up to you because you're in these positions and think that you're the coolest person and you're so lucky and so blessed and you are. But don't let that go to your head. Don't let that ruin the magic. Don't let that, you know, kind of ruin this experience for you because you can't see past your own ego. Um, and, and so, yeah, to, to answer your question simply, it's absolutely and has absolutely been, been something that's been a part of the Disney experience. But I think with the right, with the right trainers and the right people kind of informing those fresh new minds entering into these positions, it can be significantly decreased. Hmm. Um, so here's sort of a general uh, a question when it comes to face character roles. Uh, you sort of already mentioned this in the sense of feeling ill and missing one of the greatest possible moments of your career. Um, <laughs> sorry to bring it up again. Um, <laughs> but some days you don't feel super califragilistic, expialidocious, and, but you still work. Um, when it comes to grinning and bearing it, how difficult mm. is that? Or can you sustain it for the, what, 30 minutes or whatever that you're out there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of a cheap answer, but I think it, it depends on the person. It really does. For me, I, I am able to bear a lot of things uh, quite well. Uh, so, so especially, you know, towards the end of my nine years there, it was starting to feel like a job and it was starting to feel like I, I do want to leave this place before the magic is completely lost. Um, and before this becomes nothing more than just what pays the bills. But yeah, there were certainly a number of instances where I walked out there and sometimes it was the guests, sometimes it was purely me, sometimes it was the the Poppins that I was working with. Uh, but yeah, it was certainly a, a trial of, okay, remember that this may be my 50 millionth guest ever, but this is the first time ever that this person has met Bert, hmm. has met Mary Poppins, has entered this park and do it for them. And, and constantly reminding myself that this moment could be the most magical of moments for that person because it's their first time, uh, because they need it, because they've entered this park in, in a sad place and they need that extra life and extra joy. Um, that was certainly helpful, but it's it's certainly difficult. I and mean, I feel like in, in a funny sort of way, if any of the listeners have worked in retail, it's kind of like that. It's it's you you have to understand that people have entered that place with their own baggage, their own issues, and and oftentimes uh, it's your it's your opportunity. It's your it's your time. It's your chance to to make a difference in that and speak into that in some way. Um, so so for me, I, I you know thank the Lord and am able to in a lot of ways uh, bear it and, and move forwards for their sake. Uh, there are certainly there are certainly characters. Uh, excuse me, certainly individuals who play characters who just don't. If, if it's their bad day, you will know it. Mary Poppins is an extra B today. <laughs> wow. Um, and you just, you just, you're able to recognize that. Uh, but, but yeah, for, for, for most of us, I would say anyways, um, we're able to, whew, okay, put on that face for that 30 minute, 45 minute, the hour long set, uh, and, and allow these guests to experience the magic that they should. Is there a character that you wish you would have played but never got the chance to? Mm, absolutely. So I, uh, I was there right during the, the height of the of the Marvel craze. So it was very exciting when Disney ultimately purchased Marvel, and we knew that the Disney characters might be coming to our park. And my favorite Marvel character is Captain America, mm. and I just felt so confident and so excited to be able to step into that role. Uh, as Captain America. And it's one of those tough things. If you get kind of 
kind of a pigeonholed or um, typecast into a specific role, the casting directors at the Disney park may just see you as that. And it doesn't matter how closely you might look or how closely you might act to another character. If they just see you as Bert, it might be very difficult for you to cast, uh, get cast in a a role like Captain America. And obviously I can't honestly know specifically why they never chose to to cast me as, as Captain America, but it never happened. And it certainly was a bummer. I also was very interested in playing the character of Flynn for very similar similar reasons to the character of Bert. He's just happy-go-lucky. He's adventurous. He's fun. Uh, he's lighthearted. He's a great foil to the character of Rapunzel. Uh, but those two characters specifically, Captain America and um, and Flynn, were were ones that were just always just beyond my reach. Hmm. Um, let's talk about a couple characters that you did in shows. So mm-hmm. you were both Prince Philip and I believe Prince Eric in Phantasmic, correct? Correct. Uh, it's probably the most massive production that Disney oh, puts yeah. on. Um, and I'm just curious, oh, yeah. run me through a night of, of, of being on that show. Um, and generally speaking, you know, I, I, you know, the, the princes end up on a float kind of mm-hmm. through and, and sort of dance and do their thing. And then they end up on, um, I guess for you guys at Disneyland, um, would be a steamship, right? Um, on, on Mark Twain. Yeah. yeah. The steamboat. Yeah. So, um, it, what's that process like? And it, I mean, you're doing it in the dark and it, I mean, it must feel more, um, as someone who's done musicals, you've done uh, plays and musicals before in, in college. And I have, of that yes. nature. Um, does it have that vibe backstage opposed to parades and that sort of thing? Oh goodness. Yes. I mean, that, that's the perfect way to describe it, Nathan. It really is. It's there is, there is a mad energy, uh, with the entire fantastic show and such a camaraderie within it. Because it's one of those things, and and this is not me in any way saying that the show was unsafe. Not at all. But there is constantly this, must be safe, can't do that, must be safe, can't do that, in every other place that I ever worked at Disneyland. With Fantasmic, it was show first, hopefully this is safe. Um, There is much sprinting in the dark, on the mud, in the wet, uh, running around from different positions, one to the other, to make this show come together. So... For example, uh, if you were to watch the show, the character of Prince Philip, for example, he only shows up in the final moments of the show. He's on the Mark Twain steamboat as it seems by, and they're waving banners all in unison, and it's great, and it's beautiful. But you might not know that the actor who plays Prince Philip has been in two other positions previously. The first of which is uh, during one of the opening sequences where on the, the... Mist screens is projected a bunch of flowers and beautiful images. In the background on the stage is this large opening and closing flower. And Philip is in the center of that flower, one of the two center uh, petals opening and closing. So at that point, uh, I've got black sweats on, I've got a white top on and a white hood on, and then this massive petal on my back. And uh, previous to being on stage, I've gone backstage and I've lined up along along the side of the island there and uh, I have had these texts put this put this pedal on me, which is attacked via Velcro. And I stand there waiting and we at the right cue march forwards to the edge of the stairs, waiting to go on stage, and then at the right cue we march on the stage, take formation, and after we've taken formation, the black lights turn on, revealing the pedal that we are, excuse me, the flower that we are. And we open and close and open and close and rotate and rotate and open and close. All to very specific counts, which we've obviously rehearsed beforehand. Um, and then on the right beat we turn a pedal sideways and march off stage. Um, brief random antidote on one specific day and marching off stage, the, the stage being extremely wet because of the, the, the uh, mist screens. I totally biffed it. I, I ate so much crap. I fell flat on my face. But you bet your bottom dollar I was back up in an instant <laughs> because the show must go on. Uh, and, you know, so you, and then at that point, once you've exited stage, you are – it's it's beautiful. It's like it's it's some sort of beautiful sport. You're ripping the velcro off your chest, tossing this massive, gosh, fifteen foot by five foot pedal off to a stage tech as you're sprinting by them. You're handing this off as you go by, and sprinting as fast as you can back down the path, ripping off your white top, dropping your white top off, and then doing a U turn and running back to stage. At which point, again, for Prince Philip's character you would take a position behind one of the limbs of the Pinocchio puppets. So the next section of the Phantasmic show 
a two-dimensional wooden Pinocchio puppet and two dancing ladies appear next to him on stage and they dance around and do a little kind of can-can action. And we have different, uh, different characters behind each limb. So for Prince Philip, he was Pinocchio's left arm. And I can still, I'm right now even just doing that, that <laughs> choreography. Um, and at this point, you are completely in black. So the black lights shining on the Pinocchio puppet only illuminate Pinocchio. And then Prince Philip or the person playing Prince Philip is completely uh, masked. And the great thing about that position specifically, and honestly, all the positions, is you can scream at the top of your lungs at your your fellow actors, you know, like, stop, stop failing so hard. Or don't, don't touch my butt. Get off me. You know, you, we just have so much fun. There, there's just this constant <laughs> harassing of one another and uh, just silly shenanigans, um, you know, and, and sometimes it's just to, to, to get a rise out of each other. Like, oh, I'm going to trip you and that kind of thing um, as we're running around screaming. Right, because none of the uh, audience can, I mean, they're far enough away and they're, they're oh, getting yes. blasted yeah. with the actual show yeah. soundtrack. So, Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the audience is far, far away, and the music is blaring. So there's no, there's no way that they can hear you. And I would love to know if they could. I mean, maybe, maybe someone's like, "Hey, did someone just say something? What was that?" <laughs> um, but after that puppet falls down, uh, which also I should note is an interesting position because each of these elements that are connected to the stage must rise out of the stage. Um, the conclusion of which is the large dragon Murphy, as we called him, based upon Murphy's law, because everything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> this dragon rarely worked. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge pit essentially beneath this stage. And if if the if the Pinocchio puppets or or Murphy hasn't risen correctly, you could fall to your death into the stage. So before sprinting up to to man Pinocchio's arms, we had to make sure that nothing was uh, open or or deadly. Uh, for our for our existence so after finishing our pinocchio position again you would sprint probably uh, probably half a mile um down a path along the side of the island again sprinting as fast as you can and around to the back side of the island at which point you would uh jump aboard the mark twain and you would take off your black outfit under which would be a lot of your prince philip outfit uh so your tights your top and as I called it, the diaper of doom, which was essentially just a pink diaper. Uh, you can't really see on Prince Philip, but it's essentially his yeah, his diaper. It, it looks exactly like a diaper. Imagine a large adult sized diaper that's pink. Um, and then you would uh, you would throw on your wig, and there's a stylist back there who would very quickly do a little touch ups, a little, a little hairspray on Prince Philip's wig, and then you would pop out for your uh, for your banner routine, uh, and that would close the show for Prince Philip. Uh, for Prince Eric, it wasn't that different. Um, we would start in, in one of these elephant positions. So actually, kind of chronologically, this happens right after the opening and closing flower that I recently described. These elephants would appear on stage, um, which again was all to do with black light technology where on the back side of you was this elephant printed on this material that you would essentially have wrapped around you and you would stretch and move it to make these elephants dance around. After which, and this is the fastest sprint on the island, after which you'd throw off that elephant outfit and sprint back. I'm talking as fast as you can. Uh, an all out quarter mile sprint to, to, to throw off your black outfit and jump on the Prince Eric barge with uh, Princess Ariel and do the, the routine on there. At the end of which you would get off the barge, get on the Mark Twain and do that final banner routine. Man, that's quite the night. It's, it's great. I mean, Nathan, it's, it's one of those things that it, it makes sense that certain people had been in that show since it opened in 92, I believe. Uh, it's it's just so much fun. There's a great energy. If you have a great cast, there's nothing like it. For sure. Um, so you, as you said before, you also trained in face character work um, mm -hmm. for the park. Um, and so what sort of, what sort of if, if there's someone out there who is like, I would love to be a face character uh, in the Disney parks, what kind of tips mm -hmm. do you have? I mean, of course you sort of, they're looking for specific looks, but are there other elements of uh, the acting or your portrayals mm -hmm. um, that would look good in an audition? Definitely. When it comes to the auditions specifically, and actually I have worked a number of auditions, uh, one of the biggest turnoffs are those that come in uh, trying to telegraph, this is the specific character that you should see me as. So if someone comes in saying, I'm Ariel, and they've curled their hair, they've sprayed it red, they've actually donned a shell bikini, 
um, or any subtle variation of that. We've had girls come in with dark black hair and they have a little, little red bow in their hair and just a little extra rouge on their cheeks. It, it, that, that does not help you at all. Um, those that have been in these positions to cast have seen everyone. They've cast hundreds and hundreds of individuals in these roles and they are incredibly good at seeing is your bone structure, is your body type appropriate for this character? They don't need those extra little hints. They don't need those extra little uh, encouragements. If anything, those only discourage them because their first priority, obviously, is to get the right look into the into the character and the right acting type into the character. But in addition to that, if they have the time and space to, to judge and to weigh in, it's also, is this the right person to be an employee at Disneyland? And if there is someone who so clearly exemplifies just this kind of uh, Disney, like, I will do anything for this position. I am so obsessed with this. I will weep every single time I see one of my favorite characters backstage. And we have accidentally casted people like this. Don't get me wrong. Uh, that's not that's not their first uh, their first choice. So more than anything, coming in and being relaxed and confident in who you are versus what you want them to see you as is huge. It really is huge. And if you get past that casting that that casting um, call and, and you get you get asked to to come in and uh, start training for the role, the biggest thing that any trainer could ask for is a willingness to learn. Uh, even if you've seen Tangled a hundred times, there's always space to learn. What does it look like to be Rapunzel in the park? I know who Rapunzel is in the movie, but what does it look like to be Rapunzel who interacts with and responds to guests day in and day out? So that the ability to learn and that willingness to learn is huge. Mm. I remember, uh, it was on Facebook. And you posted a YouTube video uh, of your mm. sort of your farewell, as it were, uh, when you quit Ooh. Disney. Um, mm. It is uh, it made me a little emotional and I don't even work there. Um, and I think it, the best way to sort of explain it is you kind of thread the line between sort of voicing some of the characters in voiceover and sort of showing um elements of the park sort of separately um and, and in that way it doesn't really ruin any sort of magic or anything of that nature tell me a little bit about your decision to make that sort of final video and then in, in sort of your choice of leaving disney yeah so w- when it comes to just important moments in my life i've i've often recognized that the the thing the the activity the 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 action that in my life requires the most thought and intention is something creative. Uh, it, it just requires a lot of thought and a lot of effort. So when important moments happen in my life, I like to in some way express that artistically because it requires me to, to think about it intentionally. It requires me to, to put effort into, into creating something that it expresses and communicates how I feel, where I've been. So so even as I as I came to the close of my Disney career, I was feeling, you know what, this is this is the right time. I, I'm I'm ready to leave. I'm I'm ready to say goodbye to these characters and to these these coworkers and to this park. I still wanted to acknowledge that there had been so many sweet, heartfelt, real moments in that place. And so I said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna put together this video um, that in some way represents what it meant uh, to work here. So. So what I did is actually one of the great things about being an employee is you can enter the park before it opens. So I was able to shoot a bunch of these uh, these shots of different elements of of the park before guests or too many guests, anyways, had entered the park, um, and then kind of lay over it um, some of uh, some of the moments that I had interacted with guests or or uh, or whatnot. And and what I did is actually I, I shot specifically just the locations that I had actually been as either a character or as an attractions host. Um, so it was very kind of near and dear and personal to my heart. And it was just, it was, yeah, it was just my way of saying, I stood here, I existed here. I did something, I met people here. I, I worked hard here. I, I, I laughed here. I sometimes cried here. I sometimes was very frustrated here. And it was just, for me, a good way of visually representing where I'd been in, in kind of an, in a very small way what I experienced, uh, in those places. And, and yeah, it was one of those funny things that I didn't, 
I, I'm one of those people that I, as an actor, I can, I can conjure up motion and I can make myself quote unquote feel a certain way. Um, but I have, I still have no control over my genuine emotions. Uh, and I don't think anyone does. Uh, but it was this really profoundly moving time when I came to my last day and I actually finished that video on my very last day of working there where I, I played that video backstage for one of my closest friends at Disney. He was one of the Mary Poppinses. And then we went out for our last set and came back and, and she kind of instantly broke into tears and said, oh, thank you so much. It's been beautiful. And and again, I'm, I, I'm wanting to feel something. I'm wanting to feel remorse and sadness that this time is over, but nothing's really coming that much yet. And, and as we're walking backstage, I just, I happened to pass by another coworker and I just, I just, I simply said the words, thank you to him. And instantly I was in tears. It was, it was one of those very profound moments where I, I realized that that individual and, and my Mary Poppins in this entire time had been so kind and so uh, generous and so giving to me. And, and don't get me wrong. This isn't, this isn't a place that's perfect. This isn't a place that, that isn't without its warts, but but really what I had experienced was something that was so, uh, so real. Um, and I, ex- I had experienced, like I mentioned, laughter and tears and frustration in this place. And, and in that moment, just seeing that random, that random coworker that I said, thank you to, I was in a real way re- able to, to remember all of that. Um, and, and that's what I'm, I'm very thankful for with, with my entire time there and the way that that, that video that you've just been talking about kind of captures that. So let me, uh, let's end with this. We had tried to record this uh, podcast before. Um, and uh, I uh, sat down and uh, got everything ready. And uh, uh, he didn't, you know, he just didn't show up on Skype. And so I, I, I texted you or tweeted at you or something. And I said, hey, are we still doing this? And uh, you were sort of like, didn't you get my message? And I, I hadn't been on whatever platform you had posted. Um, yeah. And, uh, I was like, no, what's up? And and you said, oh, my wife's giving birth, um, which was a good reason to not show up for a podcast. Um, and it was, uh, you, you were very apologetic and I saw no reason for it because uh, if there's any excuse that works, it's probably that. Um, but my final question for you is sort of related to that, which is you've mm. seen many kids in the parks as a part of your job. Mm. How do you think your relationship with the parks now change now that you're a father? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I think, thank you so much for that. Um, I feel like my relationship to the parks is very similar to my relationship to any Disney property, which is very similar to any sort of artistic expression, which is, this is a beautiful place to allow a young mind and an old mind, but a young mind especially to begin to experience the truths and the realities of everyday life. There are a lot of difficult things in our world today. A a lot of ideas, a lot of people, a lot of fears, a lot of hopes that are difficult to articulate and to to grapple with. And and sometimes you need some sort of conduit to to usher you from, from a place of immaturity to a place of maturity, a place of uh, ignorance to a place of understanding, a place of fear to a place of knowledge and acceptance. And one of the beautiful things about about what Walt Disney did with his films and what the Walt Disney Corporation continues to do in a lot of ways with, with the Walt Disney Park is, is help younger individuals uh, make that transition, to, to make those connections and to start to understand things that will help them to to mature and to grow and to be less fearful and to be more understanding and more hopeful and more accepting. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's one of those things that when I started working at Disneyland, I, I wasn't dating, I wasn't engaged, I wasn't married, and I certainly wasn't a father. But even at the very beginning, I did smile to myself and say, this is going to be a great story to tell my grandchildren. And and by that, I mean, this is this is a this is a park. This is a brand. This is a, a story that is known the world over. Um, and the fact that I've been able to be a part of that, I think is so invaluable. And I can't wait to, when the time is right, 
uh, share that with my son and allow that specific piece of information to just further uh, encourage his, his maturation and his growth and, uh, and, and to share that specific idea and, and the truths that I've learned through it with him. It's just, yeah, it's very exciting and it's very, uh, it's very much something I'm looking forward to. Well, Chris Hartwell, uh, thank you for being on dream finders. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been fun. I, uh, I'll tell you right now, I, I wouldn't discuss this with just anyone, Nathan. Uh, and the fact that, 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 that you came to me, someone that I genuinely know there is no sort of, uh, lie or uh, dishonesty in your love of and appreciation of, uh, Disney and the Disney parks. Uh, it makes it very easy to, to, to be candid with you. So, so thank you. And that's it for this episode of dream finders. I'd like to thank Chris Hartwell for being my guest. If you'd like to know more about what he's up to, check him out on Twitter or head on over to his movie and review YouTube channel, the heartbeat and heart here is spelled H A R T. Our podcast artwork is provided by JP Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by Walt Disney World News Today, the world leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at WDWNT.com. Dream Finders is hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Tell your friends about the show and please reach out if you or someone you know would make an excellent guest. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. DreamFinders is sponsored by Never Grow Up Vacations, the official travel partner of WDWNT.com. Never Grow Up Vacations specializes in trips to Disney destinations around the world. So be like us and never grow up. Head over to NeverGrowUpVacations.com to book your next trip today.